Hello and welcome to the World Economic Forum in Davos and this special debate on France 24. Today we're discussing the $240 billion a year problem of tax avoidance. In a year when, yet again, the Paradise Papers showed us that the global tax system appears to be broken, we're asking if global tax avoidance can be stopped. This at a time when the global tax system is undergoing a major shift with the US slashing corporate rates and other governments struggling to tax major digital companies. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by David Serra, CEO of Algebras Investments. From Ireland, the Minister for Finance, Public Expenditure and Reform, Pascal Donoghue. From Oxfam International, Executive Director, Winnie Bianima. From the European Commission, Pierre Moscovici, Commissioner for Taxation and Economic Affairs. And the Nobel Prize winning economist, Professor Joseph Stiglitz of Columbia University. Thank you to you all uh, for joining us. This is not a new issue. We know that there have been efforts made to tackle this in the past. One of the efforts we have had in the past year is the European Union publishing its blacklist of tax havens. Uh, Pierre Moscovici, I'm going to start with you. We started out with 17 countries on that list. It's coming down now uh, to nine. Is this an effective system? Well, uh, first I would like to say that um, you said the uh, tax system was uh, broken. There are problems, but we are trying to solve them. And I see huge changes uh, for the last five years with the uh, OECD, BEPS initiative, the G20 work, and what we've done uh, inside the EU, for example, two directives uh, on anti-tax avoidance or the exchange of information uh, uh, for tax rulings, which was the answer to a previous scandal. Those scandals are useful because they push us to decide. And the, the blacklist is probably the most spectacular thing we've done, but it's not the most important. I will come back later on CCCTB, which is a major uh, breakthrough uh, when we talk about taxation, or uh, our intention uh, to make proposals uh, to tax the digital economy, and these proposals will be on the table in March. But to come back to the list, this question is more for Pascal than for me, because it's not the Commission's list, it's the Member States' list. I understand that when you take out of a list of 17, one month after eight countries, there is a problem of credibility. You can't see that that way. There is another way to see it, which is to say, OK, it proves that it has a dissuasive effect and that it convinces some countries to make commitments they didn't make initially uh, in order to uh, get to a better uh, tax uh, governance. Uh, those countries made those commitments. The uh, Code of Conduct Group, which is intergovernmental, approved that the ministers decided to take those countries out of the blacklist. But uh, one thing which must be clear is that they are not totally out of the screening, not at all. They enter into a gray list. The gray list uh, is a list of countries which have made commitments. And these commitments are not vague promises. Either they are uh, implemented, and then they get out of any list, or they are not implemented. And then they get back to the blacklist, and we must define sanctions on that. I will take an example. Uh, in a few minutes from now, I will have a, a meeting with the president of Panama on his own request. Uh, and I welcome this dialogue. Panama has taken commitments. And this has led the ministers to say, OK, it's no more on the blacklist, but it's in the gray list. And my message to the president of Panama will be a friendly one. You've taken commitments. You, these commitments must be seriously implemented, or else in one year from now, we'll come back to the blacklist. And so uh, the list is not uh, one day uh, forever. Uh, it's a moving process. And the credibility of the process will be shown by, first, perpetual screening. Second, movements in the lists. Third, transparency. And I ask the minister uh, to make transparent the commitments made by all the countries in the gray list. I didn't succeed uh, last Tuesday. But dear Pascal, I hope next time you will make it, because uh, we cannot ask the others from transparency and not being transparent ourselves. So these commitments must be made public so that NGOs, medias, parliaments, citizens uh, can watch this and control that they are uh, really implemented. And finally, uh, again, it's uh, uh, for the uh, finance ministers of the EU, we must have sanctions, because a list without sanction is not credible. We, the EU, as such, the Commission, we are taking we are going to take sanctions. I will explain that in a few weeks from now. So this is the package. Let's not have just a, a spectacular remark 
uh, nine less proves it doesn't work. No, it's more complex. Okay, Winnie Beema, are you uh, now reassured that this list is going to help? Well, there are steps in the right direction, but if I was a school teacher asked to make a report, I would say promising, but need to work harder. <laughs> you you, you tell him, you tell it. him. Because, because, you see, some of these changes, like the blacklist, you see there are small and developing countries like Namibia, like St. Lucia, like uh, Samoa, a little island in the Pacific. But then serious tax havens, really, tax, haven, tax do dodging countries or where money is stashed, like the Netherlands, like Switzerland, are not there. And then they create a gray list and move out countries, European countries, back onto a gray list out of the, and this, without letting everybody know why, what commitments have they made to come out of black to gray. So the, the credibility of these lists and ultimately the impact of them is questionable. But also some of the changes that are being introduced on country, public country by country reporting, some of the European countries like Ireland are not quite on board, I don't know. But really, there are steps in the right direction, but there are baby steps. We okay. want to see stronger commitments. We want to see that public country by country reporting means that developing countries, citizens there, can also see where profits are being made and, where ta and how much tax is being paid. But if it's just between the operational area of Europe, then those who are cheated the most are not getting sight, line of sight of what is happening. And let me conclude that this issue of tax avoidance is not just about euros, yens, and dollars. It's about human rights. It's about people who are denied access to the services they need to lift themselves out of poverty because of tax avoidance. Okay, uh, Minister Pascal Donoghue, um, Winnie Benjamin did mention there that the Netherlands and Luxembourg would be on the blacklist. She's being polite because Oxfam did say at the same time that Ireland should be on the EU tax haven list as well. Is Ireland a tax haven? Uh, the, uh, if you look at the definition that has been developed of a tax haven according to the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, they lay out a number of different uh, principles uh, that a jurisdiction must meet to be a tax haven. And Ireland meets none of those criteria. Uh, we are a country who has a very broad uh, tax base and a low tax rate uh, on that broad base. We have a politically independent organisation that collects our taxes and implements tax policy. What is uh, true to say is that we have an element of the proposition that we use to uh, attract jobs and investment in our countries. In other words, our corporate tax rate of 12.5%. We have used that as an element to help Ireland deal with the challenges that we can have by being a very small economy located on the edge of Europe. But from my point of view, what I want to do is ensure that we maintain our competitiveness, but also respond back to the changes that I accept need to be made in corporate tax policy, both nationally and internationally. And I think the competitiveness of our tax rate is well understood but I also believe that many changes that we have made uh, does not get the credit and hearing that it deserves too. So if you look at, for example, uh, country by country reporting, we were one of the first countries to implement country by country reporting. Of course, it's fair to say it's not public. And the reason for that is we have a principle in Ireland that the affairs of an individual with the tax authority should be private. We are one of the first countries to implement mandatory disclosure requirements. So in other words, now, if there's an organisation in Ireland, such as an accountant, involved in aggressive tax planning on behalf of a client, they need to inform our revenue commissioner of this. We've eliminated many difficulties in our tax code, such as stateless companies. And as Minister for Finance, in my last finance bill, I've now put in place the legal provision to now go and implement all the provisions of the OECD and the BEPS process. 
Uh, so I'm very committed to helping our country continue to be competitive. Um, and tax is an element of it, but so is having a young, educated workforce. That's as important. And then deal with all of the issues that we acknowledge need to be dealt with. But we also want to point to the progress that we have made in tackling many of those things. OK, uh, Professor Stiglitz, should Ireland be given credit for these, having taken these steps and having moved towards signing up to these international <laughs> systems? Well, the answer is really the same that Winnie said, you know, baby steps. But uh, one has to understand the depth of the, of the problems in, in Ireland. But before mentioning that and, and put it in, in context, uh, Panama, paper, Panama Papers and Paradise Papers uh, brought home uh, the importance of illicit activities, people hiding. The real problem with our global tax system, I mean, that is a problem and a really serious problem, but there is a problem of a global tax system that allows people legally to avoid paying taxes or reduce their taxes and has led to a race to the bottom in which there's just been another entry into that race to the bottom, which is the United States, mm. uh, lowering its corporate tax rate. So, you know, we know where this race to the bottom is going to end. Ireland is a bad player in this. Uh, you know, 12%, why not 10%? Somebody else is 9%, 8%. Where does this end? Mm. And unless we get global cooperation, it ends at zero. And as zero, as Winnie said, we won't have the money for infrastructure, for addressing climate change, for addressing poverty. We won't have the money for any of the things our society needs. So we really need uh, global cooperation. But let me, let me be more specific about Ireland. Uh, the big case that everybody knows was the Apple mm. uh, case. $13 billion of revenue that were generated all over Europe that were funneled into Ireland, created a few jobs, but we're stealing revenue from all the other countries of Europe. And let's be clear, it was stealing revenue and to some extent jobs from other places in Europe because it was a secret agreement. If that agreement had been transparent and open to every other company, Europe would have not had zero corporate tax revenue from American companies. When it was exposed, it was pointed out by Vestager, who has been a real champion on this and other things, that it was illegal. And they were engaged in illegal activity in undermining state aid, which is trying to get a basic framework within Europe for fair competition. What did Ireland do? Did it say, we need $13 billion? And you did after what happened in the crisis. You needed $13 billion. So what did they do? They sided with Apple. Apple has used the same ingenuity to deliver those iPhones that you love so much to avoid taxes. And Ireland did get tougher. And so what did, what did Apple do? Move to the next European, uh, not EU, uh, uh, tax of, uh, 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 health, uh, uh, tax avoiding country, um, one, of the, uh, one of the Channel Islands. So you know, what we see is deep commitment by a company that tries to make a pretense of corporate responsibility. I say the first element of corporate responsibility is paying your taxes. And it's using that ingenuity to avoid taxes. And the globalization system has been used to make sure that we don't have double taxation. It could have been used to make sure we didn't have zero taxation. But the corporations didn't want it. And what they didn't want we didn't get. Okay, Apple, it's worth pointing out, says that it pays all the taxes it's supposed to in the countries that it owes it. Uh, they're not here to represent themselves, so it's worth mentioning that. Minister, who just briefly, can you respond to it? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm here, obviously, to represent <laughs> Ireland, uh, of course. Uh, and actually, many of the principles uh, that Professor Stiglitz outlined, actually, uh, I do agree with. And I gave him a bit of a fright when I walked in earlier on, and I told the professor that I have many of his books in my office. <laughs> and they've educated me for many years on the discontents of globalization. And Ireland strongly supports free trade. We strongly support globalization. But we recognize that if the discontents that the professor has referred to are not dealt with, there runs a risk of that all being terminally undermined. And where I agree with the professor is that international, and then where needs be, EU cooperation, is the 
best way in which we can respond back to that. Where you'll appreciate I differ with the professor on is firstly, Ireland has no intention in being part of a race to the bottom. We have, a, we have had a corporate tax rate now that has been unchanged for many, many, many years. We're seeing other countries reduce it now, theirs now. Ours is already not the lowest in the European Union. We have no plans to change it at all because we're not going to be part of what the professor has outlined. And then secondly, in relation to Apple, the reason why we took the stance that we did is because we do not do deals with individual companies. Apple have been present in Ireland for 40 years, as have many other companies. And it is not in the interests of companies or investors that we have in Ireland, or all the ordinary taxpayers that I represent, to do any deal with any of them. And we don't. Okay. And uh, while I know this is the source of fierce debate, and I'm involved in most of it myself, <laughs> I, I do need to use this opportunity to acknowledge that the objectives that we need to tackle, we need to make progress on us, and we are. But it isn't Ireland's role or indeed ability to be a global tax collector. What we can influence and what we can do, we're going to do while retaining the competitiveness of a very small and very open economy. Okay, David Sarah, I want to come to you to, for a private sector view on this as well. Will companies not always just go wherever they can pay the least tax? Absolutely. So my view is very simple. I think here, in reality, we're lying to voters and I think business has to stand up and do numbers. So for example, um, and I just go through a, a couple of uh, simple uh, numbers. Google, not to refer Apple, in Ireland, and I use Ireland simply because the finance minister, we can do this the same for Luxembourg and uh, benevolence, booked revenue of 22.6 billion euro, 22.6 billion euro in 2015. They pay to Ireland only 48 million euro. Ireland says they have a tax rate of 12.5%. This is competitive. There's only one problem. In Ireland, if you set up a business, and the business is 100% controlled abroad, you basically pay zero taxes. So it's correct within tax law in Ireland, they are correct. There's only one problem. What happens if everybody were to book their foreign subsidiary in Ireland? And that's what's happening now. So running the numbers, this is realized 60 billion euro tax illusion, evasion. I consider borderline to criminal in three member states. Of course, they're not going to say, and they're going to put themselves on the blacklist. It's easy to put Samoa Island or someone else. And why is the system 100% rated? Because too many people benefit out of it. The consultants, the auditors, all the bureaucrats, and so I think it's very simple. You need to have, by law, that any corporation that is listed and wants to have global standard, give me one number, total tax paid, where, total number. If you, were, if you had asked this to Facebook, take Facebook, they pretend to be a good citizen. Now they paid 4,000 pound, 4,000 pound of taxes in 2014 in the UK. If I take reported, if I add every annual report of Facebook globally, and I see what's the tax paid, the number is zero. They post $10 billion profit. So explain to someone, if I add every annual report that you file in every country, and you pay zero taxes, so it's very simple. If you are a listed company in the world, you must give me one number, total tax paid, in which country? And all this discussion ends. So the if transparency not, is, the, is the key element it's, there. We're going to have to take a short break, but do join us after the news headlines for more from this special debate from the World Economic Forum in Davos. You're welcome back to Davos and this special debate from the world. Oh. <laughs> it, it was all going so well. Welcome back to the World Economic Forum in Davos. In this debate, we're discussing the subject, can global tax avoidance be stopped? 
Before the break, David Serra was saying that transparency is what's needed here for us to understand where we can, where we can, where companies are paying their tax. Winnie Binyamin, you wanted to go in on that? Yes, actually, now I want to defend Ireland, represent <laughs> Ireland. After all, I was educated by Irish nuns. But <laughs> what I want to say is that um, this is a huge problem. Money is flowing out of countries out of the productive economy and being stashed in uh, tax havens and tax denying people vital services. It's like water flowing out of a leaking bucket. We have a global system that is really faulty, that is old, that hasn't been changed over a long time. But what we need is not just little steps here and there. We need global cooperation on a global corporate tax reform. We can't do this, we can't stop this harmful tax competition without global cooperation. My issue is that countries got together, rich countries got together and started a BEPS process that has helped them make little fixes in their own economies for themselves to benefit from their own companies, leaving out the needs of a big part of the world, developing mm -hmm. countries. You, could, you had in the BEPS process countries like Luxembourg, which is a tax haven, sitting there negotiating a reform, and a country like Bangladesh, like Vietnam, not having a seat at the table. So we need, and the place to do this is the United Nations, because that's where we all can sit in equality and put our interests on the table and negotiate a new tax system. So that's one. Then on transparency, I can't agree more that we need, to, that that's an important part of it, but it's not the end of it. Mm -hmm. Transparency is important, but you need more than that. You need rules to govern how these companies behave. Let's not forget that really we are in a system where greed is good. This is the kind of economy we are in where companies are encouraged to maximize for shareholders, and that's why they dodge tax, and that's why they depress wages, and that's why they slash labor rights. It's all about maximizing for shareholders. So unless we really look more broadly and fix an economy that's incentivizing tax dodging, we will not solve this problem. Pierre Moscovici, uh, you our European Commissioner now, you're a former French finance minister. The French president said here yesterday his plan, he wanted you know, companies, those big digital companies, to uh, report how much they earn in each country so, they can, uh, so that they can pay tax on it accordingly. Is this something that the European Union can help with? Yes. Uh, as I said, we are going to make uh, proposals uh, by uh, beginning of spring in order to make sure that uh, digital companies pay their fair share of tax, no more, no less where they create values and profits. As far as we know, today the average uh, uh, taxation on those companies is 9% compared to 23 for, I would say, normal company. I'm talking about average. Uh, and there is a problem there of level playing field, which is uh, something we can understand because uh, our corporate tax system is 100 years old and it's not adapted to digital uh, companies. So we are going to make ambitious proposals as well on common corporate tax base and also on specific taxation. But if I come back on the debate, um, uh, first I would like to tell my two professors here uh, that uh, I'm not so sure that we're making little steps. I think we're making consistent steps and that really the wind, the mode has changed and you must not blame those who have made progress. When I speak with Pascal and with his predecessor, I can see that there is a, a huge change in the Irish attitude towards uh, the uh, European and, and global tax system. But uh, I, I would insist on, on three points. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, about uh, uh, CCTB, uh, not, uh, about public uh, reporting, uh, country by country reporting, CBCR. It must be made public. I don't accept the idea that there is a contradiction between competition, investment, uh, and transparency. You can have both. When I was finance minister in my country, I established CBCR for the French banks. Are they less competitive than the uh, Spanish, Italian, uh, or Portuguese, or Greek banks? No. So that's the first point. 
we have established CBCR between administration, we need to move further. Second, there is a notion that needs to be introduced. If I look at the Apple case, the problem is not so much that the uh, tax rate is 12.5% in Ireland. Uh, that's uh, uh, national sovereignty, and as you said, you don't want to add more. The problem is the effective tax rate, uh, the tax rate which is effectively paid. If my colleague and friend, Margaret Vestager, raised the case, it's because she uh, said that the, the effective tax rate was 0.05%. Uh, the o and the OECD does disagree with that. The OECD says that Ireland's factor tax rate is something just under 12%. No, no. The, again, uh, again, there is a decision from the Commission, uh, and, 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 and even uh, uh, Apple uh, took a provision, so it takes, it's for serious. So I think that what David has said, finally, should be taken for serious. The best way, and it's linked to CBCR, is to look at where this or that company acts and where it pays taxes. That's an economic approach, which would be, I think, as performant as the uh, BEPS approach, because the BEPS approach is about uh, commitments, institutions, and yes, Seems if you look at the BEPS approach, there is no tax haven uh, in the EU. Certainly not. But if you look uh, at the economic approach, you see that there are some countries which are, let's say, more attractive than others. Okay, uh, Mr. Nunn, i just come to you very quickly on that. The effective tax rate? Well, uh, the OECD, as you have said, have acknowledged that our tax code and tax base is different. But more importantly, from my, as importantly from my point of view, the Revenue Commissioner in Ireland and our controller and Auditor General, who are independent bodies, who both collect tax and then assess the implementation of policy, have said that the average effective tax rate in Ireland when it comes to corporate tax rates is approximately 10%. We do not have the lowest tax rate in the European Union when it comes to corporate tax. And then we do not do deals either regionally or in policy areas of that rate. Okay. And that has uh, been the bedrock of much of what we have done. But I do want to emphasise again that while I am contending very strongly the legitimate role of a policy like that to deal with the scale and size of our economy amidst a huge global marketplace, I also want to acknowledge and I appreciate Pierre acknowledging the progress that we have made, that we do want to deal with matters to ensure we continue to, part, to be part of good and then best practice. And some of the changes that were made, and I have made many of them now myself as Minister for Finance, were made at a time when our economy was in grave difficulty. And we made those changes because it's part of what our country wants to be about, to make sure it matches up with the values of our citizens, creates jobs, and then deals with many of the matters that have been raised okay. by the panel. David, sorry. sorry. And I'm speaking as a European citizen. So. I'm a European citizen too. Yes, and to nationality. <laughs> so and am the, I. And it now, so it's very simple. Within Irish tax code, if you have a multinational that is 100% directed outside Ireland, de facto, you're not taxed. Hence, and this is the law, and I'm happy to challenge you in rule of law. So Google, 22.6 billion revenue in Europe, 2015. How much taxes they paid in Ireland? 48. Equates to 0.002. Better deal than Apple. Hence, every study, and it's the same, and I run my uh, UCIT regulated business by the CBI in Ireland. So I'm a businessman in Ireland. It's very simple. Ireland, if you are in Ireland, it, you charge 12.5%. If you are someone global, you put everything there, they don't see you. Now, this has equated to more than 20 billion euro illusion per year of European taxes. Then, as a European citizen, I look at an Irish citizen. Since you've joined the European Union, Ireland has net contributed to the EU budget 150 million euro. Why are you allowing illusion, so less revenue, losses to European citizen of 20 billion? It's a ratio that is 500 times per year. When I say, and I love Ireland, and I have a business in Ireland, and it's a great business community, tax everyone, no matter where they come from, up 12.5%. Because if you tax people at 0 0.002, this is a joke. And you're okay, well, citizen, just and let the ministry respond to that. Well, and we'll and, and, and I'm, you know, we're, we're delighted that you have your business located in Ireland, and you find it such a good such a good environment to do business in, which is great. And I speak as an Irish citizen, an Irish finance minister, and I'm humbled and proud to be both. 
and as a European citizen too, and as a proud member of the European Union and a committed member of one. And I go back to my core point, while I, can, I cannot and will not comment on the tax affairs of any one company, it's not appropriate for me to do so as finance minister, I believe that companies and large corporations should pay their fair share of taxes and should pay an effective rate of tax. And I believe that needs to be done in a coordinated and global manner. And I do feel, and I think Pierre was making the case, and I, I do agree with him on this, that changes that we have made through the OECD, like exchange of information, like country by country reporting, and we haven't even touched on what's happening in America at the moment, and I suspect the professor will in a moment, could and will be part of how we make progress on matters like this. Okay, first of all, let's, we're, we're, let's, let's oh, Winnie Binnie, I'll just let you come in because you had been looking yeah. to make, just make a point yeah. there quickly, if you can. I just wanted to say that Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So when there was a BEPS process and the country sitting around the table included tax havens, they were not going to dis define a tax haven as themselves. <laughs> so we, 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 really, we need to have a global process where every country is at the table to make these new rules. That's for me what I see here. We can keep pinning Ireland on 0, 0.00 and another one on zero, but the truth is that to curb this race to the bottom, we need global cooperation. And that is where I fault many countries, many leaders, for not taking this forward. There's now, we've been arguing this, and now there's going to be a global tax forum in New York in February, but, what we, but we don't want a talk shop. We want a forum with teeth to define some new rules and to enforce cooperation in this area. And let me say, a very famous Nobel Prize winning economist once said <laughs> that the idea that lowering the corporate tax rate will spur investments is fundamentally flawed. <laughs> and that and takes I just want <laughs> to say that it is so right. There are many reasons why companies that's invest, right. not just a low tax rate. Well, well that's a perfect point to discuss what's I don't happening know who in, that's in the United said. States. Is this a race to the bottom working at? Yeah. So let me try to put, first uh, put this in a, a little bit broader perspective. The critical issue here are the words uh, where value is created. And as we move into a more complex economy, it's going to be more and more difficult to answer that question. So for instance, uh, an important part of value today is the patents. And you can move those patents anywhere in the world that you want, and you can move them to a real tax haven where it's taxed at zero. So that's why the, what we call the transfer price system where you make up numbers can't work in a globalized economy. I mean, think about what the transfer price system is supposed to be, what an arm's length transaction. So what would be the value of a shirt without a sleeve? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you, know, you start thinking about a car without tires, without a chassis. There's no number you can put. So what we've created is a system that cannot work in a world of globalization. Now, within the United States, different states have uh, uh, a different uh, have corporate tax rates, um, and the question is, how do you allocate the uh, where was value created? And we realized you couldn't use the transfer price system. Uh, a shirt might go back and forth across state boundaries many, many times, and so we've created a formulaic approach which says that you have to out look at the total profits and you look at where are the employees, mm -hmm. where is the capital, where are the sales. You have some formula, it's rough justice, mm -hmm. but it's better than the no justice system that we have today. So, you know, when I was in the White House 20 years ago, I said the system was broken. And it was true then, and it is now even more broken. The problem with BEPS is that it is trying to fix a broken system by the guys who are making the profits out of the system. And so they don't want to change the formula. What they've done is they've done a little bit about profit shifting through debt, you know, a lot of fine points, 
But the big picture, they have not been able to address in years. Now, well said. Uh, the 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 so the the the, the uh, question is to expect global cooperation on this, especially when you have the tax avoiders being the main people at the table, is not something that you can expect. What I would like is Europe to take the lead and to say this. You know, we know Europe. We know the United States under Trump, who was our a tax avoider in chief. How could we expect our tax avoider in chief to be a, a constructor? He's not, of, he's not uh, here either. To global <laughs> architecture. Uh, we, the, the answer is Europe is going to have to take the lead, and a global minimum tax imposed by Europe would be the way forward. And what that would mean would be the following take the transparent, you, you list the total profits of the corporation, you say, Every corporation has to pay at least 15, 20% of their revenues. You decide where the revenues were generated, but you have to pay at least 15 or 20%. That would stop the race to the bottom. Okay. And that would generate a lot of revenue and for this is, European citizens. And this is a point as well that was made uh, in a report that was commissioned for the IMF about taxing digital companies. Uh, they, these are uh, two very well-respected economists as well, saying they don't believe the international tax system is fit for purpose. Exactly. Can I ask VC, uh, Justice Stiglitz has told you you can fix everything, essentially. Not quite, but uh, I, I, I was smiling listening to you both uh, <laughs> criticising BEPS, uh, because <laughs> you're probably partly right, but not totally. I think that is... Uh, 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 an effort that deserves some esteem, but precisely, the EU wants to go well uh, beyond and to take the lead. That's what we try to do. That's what I try to do with Margaret Vestager. We have a teamwork. Uh, she repairs what doesn't work. I try to prepare the legislation of the future. And I will take a, a few examples of what we've done and can do. First, I, I, I come back to it, public CBCR. There is a proposal for, from the Commission on the table. I would like it to be adopted. I think that's absolutely well, fundamental, and I, I think that we need help there also from NGOs and the uh, civil society. Second, we need to establish a modern corporate tax race, the tax uh, system, and that means two things to me. Uh, first, uh, common corporate tax base, because uh, the economy of today is not the economy of one century ago. And second, an ambitious way to tax the digital uh, economy. Uh, and, and that is absolutely necessary. And fourth, uh, everything that I try to do uh, through this uh, modern uh, corporate tax system is to, to, to take into account not only the nominal uh, tax rate, but the effective tax rate. And I welcome the fact that Pascal can work about it. We need that. And finally, on transparency, I will give you one more idea. Because if we've got effective taxation, it's the beginning of what uh, Joe Stiglitz uh, called for. Um, we want also transparency from intermediaries. These are bankers, lawyers, legal advisors, financial advisors, who sell uh, uh, aggressive tax planning schemes to clients. Uh, I'm not saying that these professions as such are bad, certainly not but they need to be transparent. And there is a proposal also on the table which says, okay, you must make transparent to the administration of your client the uh, tax scheme that you have sold him. I would like and I want this proposal to be adopted. So you see, uh, we, we cannot solve everything. We certainly cannot be uh, too aggressive. Uh, we must welcome Donald Trump tomorrow. I won't be there, but uh, <laughs> it's important. Uh, because the U.S. must come to multilateralism. But the EU wants to be the champion. The EU wants to be the leader. We must not only do BEPS, we must do BEPS, but plus, plus, plus. And that's why we have taken so many initiatives in the last uh, three years. Okay. David, Sarah, this is a, a, an issue, particularly when it comes to digital companies, the idea of the tax system just being out of date. How do you tax the com these companies? Well, two points I want to make. Uh, the first one, um, I think, from the Commission point of view, they just spent a couple of years implementing a new regulation, MIFID II, will have a, an impact of probably three, four billion euro savings per year. And we're dealing with 60 billion tax illusion for the last 10 years. So it's 600 billion accumulated. So my view, 
is do the commission, is stop talking, action. If next year we have another 20 billion tax elusion, yeah, I think eventually even private companies will start suing. The second message is I think we all as citizens never invest in companies that do not report their global tax rate country by country. If I were to be an elected uh, citizen, I'll very simply go to the G20 and say, OK, you're in the G20. Every G20 annual report gives me how much taxes any corporation pays in each country. That's it. And then you can add up the numbers. The third point I make now on taxation of digital. It's very simple. 200 years ago, if you were Exxon and you develop a technology to suck oil, and back then oil was the key resource, you'd go in Saudi Arabia, pay a royalty. Mm -hmm. Today, data, it's the new oil. Well, I'm sorry. They are now sucking data out of each of us, and no one is getting paid. So it's very simple. If you want to suck up data, you pay your state. And that's where the country had to stand up. And why don't they do it? Because they all are part of this rigged system, where for few jobs, they're all happy yeah, to take a picture with the CEO of Apple, or Google, and Facebook, and Donald Trump to sell their citizen. So it's very simple. As a citizen, we must rise. And we must say, you government, protect the privacy of my data. Where are they? What corporation do with it? And as we have done for telecom, airspace, we can't touch airspace, and has been auctioned. Mm. Perfect. You do the same. So anyone in private business could do it. And the reality, why aren't they doing it? Because government are colluding. It's as simple as that. Okay. And this is we leading to rise in populism, because the average guy on the street, it's not stupid. He gets it, and he's fed up. Winnie yeah. Benima, you want to come If a Spanish company is making garments, clothes in Vietnam, and selling them online and being bought in America, where is the tax paid? This is a question that Joe was talking about. We work with garment workers in countries like Vietnam. Hard-working people working 80 hours a week. They pay their taxes. They live in poverty. These people, their country, where they, ta where they make those clothes, needs a share of that tax. In order to create that environment, the road, to pay for the taxes, the, the roads, the electricity, the, the infrastructure that that country puts up that this Spanish company benefits from. So it's important to have the transparency, first of all, of the production line, where the product is made, where the capital came from, where the sale is made, and to decide on a fair way of sharing the tax so that a poor country benefits as much as possible. Then secondly, this on the question of transparency, I find it strange when the argument for privacy is made by companies. They don't want us to see across how they are making their money. Almost like how I can insist on privacy that I don't take off my clothes in public. It's not the same. We need, the, we, we need that transparency of how money, how wealth is created. They can't make the same argument as individual privacy that I ask for in my personal life. A company is not a human being. It is about making money, and it's about jobs and fairness in an economy. Then the last point I wanted to make is about um, the Europe and its leadership. I agree that Europe should lead. But as I'm saying, it's still about fairness globally. The biggest losers are poor countries. A hundred billion dollars every year is lost to developing countries because of channeling to tax havens. This is from UNCTAD. Mm -hmm. These countries, cannot sit and wait for Europe to decide to lead. We President need a global solution. President Zegletz, you want to go on this? Yeah, I just want to emphasize, uh, Winnie is absolutely right, and I want to emphasize uh, the challenge in trying to develop a global solution to the problem, because the current framework, BEPS, is being 
managed through the organization of the OECD, which is an organization of advanced industrial countries, mm -hmm. which cannot really address in an equitable way the, pro the global problems where we have to share in, the, in the, some way and based on some principle where value is created with the developing countries. And so the developed countries are under enormous pressure from their governments. We see it in the United States where after it was exposed, the, the Google, uh, the Apple uh, uh, tax avoidance, uh, everybody, they brought uh, the president of Apple uh, to Congress and they pretended nothing had happened. Uh, aren't you the champion of America? No, you're not because uh, you're either depriving Europe of tax revenue or you're depriving America of tax revenue. Uh, this, this was, you know, and then he had, uh, you might say, the, the, almost the gall to say, I will bring back the money when you have a rate, tax rate that I approve of. And it's not for in, uh, individual countries to make, uh, companies to make that decision. Now the point I, the, the UN, had a process called Finance for Development, where they recognized that development requires a lot of money. And they realized that today aid is not going to be there. And so we've invited companies to come into developing countries and said that this is going to be a source of revenue. And it hasn't proven out to be. Mm. And so the question was, how do we reform globally the tax system? And there was a discussion about the right form in which to do this. And unfortunately, the United States, supported by Europe, took the view that the tax avoiding countries, the United States and the other countries, should be running the revised system. Yeah. And India took the view, led the developing countries, and almost all the world agreed with India that that was the way, but unfortunately, we live in a world where power, a power where the United States won. Uh, Minister Pascal who, who, who Yeah, who I, I met the OECD uh, about this and other matters, were members of the OECD, and I must say, in fairness to them, my sense is they had a greater awareness of the global agenda and the development pressure than perhaps has been acknowledged here. I think they are aware of the plates that are shifting. In terms of the comments that we've made about taxation and the need for fair taxation, uh, like I stand very firmly by the principle for fair and effective taxation. If you look at where we are in Ireland at the moment, we have 1% of income payers, of income earners in Ireland pay 25% of income tax. We've changed our minimum wage four times. We've increased it four times as we've come out of our crisis. Over the last two years, we've seen income inequality in our country begin to improve as we are making the interventions we need to, to deal with the, the need, you know, respond back to the needs of our citizens. So if I feel that about the people that I'm lucky enough to try to represent, I therefore feel that large companies should pay their fair rate of tax. But I think a challenge that we're going to have here is in the digital area, how do we define the digital economy? because there's no longer such a thing I would contend as a digital economy. We now have economies that have become digitized. So it's not going to be as simple as saying, here's four companies, they need to pay more tax. What it's going to be needed is, in Europe and in Ireland, we apply taxes to economies or to sectors of economies. And of course, we are going to get into challenges then regarding how do we define a digital transaction. If the transaction that's digital in nature, if it's happening in a small company, should they be taxed the same way as a larger company? Mm. And they're all the areas that we're going to need to work through and tease through, both through the proposals that Pierre will be publishing in March or April, and then the work that the OECD will do afterwards. OK, I'm conscious that we want to take a question or two from the audience, and we're running very close to time. So if we can just, I think the... Uh, Trade Minister from Panama is here. If we can, uh, straight, if we can get a microphone, perhaps uh, for him to ask a question. Here we are down the front row. Thank you very much. Hello, um, hello, Dulcidio de la Guardia, Minister of Finance from Panama. I have one comment and, and one question to, to any one of the panelists. The comment is the following: Panama was included in the EU, EU grey list, black list. Sorry. Uh, because the EU found that the call, cent call center tax regime of Panama was harmful. When at the same time we were working very hard with the OECD on Action 5 of BEPS 
and reviewing all of the Panamanian tax rims. Uh, and by the way, um, the tax incentives offered by the, the call center regime in Panama, which is a real regime with 15,000 employees, uh, the same tax incentives are offered by all the Latin American countries that have the call centers. Um, and we, make agree, we, we, we agree with the EU to review the tax regimes, the call center tax, tax regime of Panama. We hope that all of the Latin American countries will do the same. The question is the following. We all know that the biggest harmful tax regime in the world it is the passive income regime of the United States for non-US persons. Are we ever going to see the largest economies in one of the blacklists, or is the blacklist only for small countries? <laughs> OK, Professor Siglitz. Mm. Well, first, wow. I agree that the United States is uh, a major, major problem. <laughs> and it's an, every, you know, uh, the United States forced all the other countries, including Switzerland, to engage in automatic exchange of information, mm -hmm. of tax information, but refuses to do uh, exactly. reciprocal. So uh, <laughs> real estate is the real center of tax avoidance uh, and evasion in the United States and money laundering. And uh, it is a real problem, which unli unlikely that we'll address in the next couple of years. But I also want to say, you know, after the Panama Papers came out, uh, I was asked by Panama to uh, head a committee to ascertain, uh, to, to uh, uh, determine how could Panama become a good citizen and, in terms of, of tax avoidance uh, and all the other uh, uh, aspects of, of tax uh, compliance. And uh, I agreed with one of the really active uh, 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 anti-corruption experts of, uh, from the OECD. And uh, at the beginning of our proceedings, we said the first condition that we have, if we're going to have an investigation into transparency, is the results of our proceedings had to be transparent. We would give the government time, a month, whatever you wanted to respond, but we wanted to make sure that our report was transparent so that everybody could see what was wrong. And the answer we got after we waited weeks and weeks and weeks was, no, we're not going to be transparent. And so what Mark Pyth and I did, uh, Mark Pyth and I did, uh, was to write the report. We had to resign. We had no choice. We could not be a participant in a whitewash of a non-transparent regime. So what we did is we report, uh, 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 wrote a report of overcoming the shadow economy of what we would have said had we been allowed to say it as part of the advice to Panama. So you can get this, uh, uh, download it in Frederick Ebert Stiftung uh, as, as a model of what countries ought to do, including the United States. And that's why I accepted it, because I wanted Panama to be a model for the United States. Didn't work out. OK, just for a moment there, just for television purposes, I just need to conclude this. We will continue right up to the time, and I'm going to ask all the panellists to come to their conclusions in just a moment. But just for the purposes of television, we need to just uh, say goodbye. So thank you to all of my guests for participating uh, in this debate from the World Economic Forum. Thank you to you at home for watching. Stay with us on France 24. But for now, goodbye from Davos. OK, just before... Just before we come to conclusions, I'd just like to play you a short video. Our reporter, Armel Coe, spoke to some people in Paris about this issue, just to give us an idea of what people, you know, that, that aren't in this room are saying about the issue uh, of tax evasion. I wouldn't do that sort of thing. But I think that everyone has their, their own morality. Way. And these people don't have much, unfortunately. I think there's a part of the banking system that leaves the door open to tax avoidance, especially for the rich clients. I don't think it's something offered to everybody. I think the state should put more barriers in the way of companies because they have too big an impact on the economy. They're not judged like everyone else. They have a special status. And it's not fair. I think the financial advising profession needs to adhere to a strict moral code. And then at an international level, there needs to be a bit more bravery from certain institutions and certain governments.
I challenge you all, we've three minutes left, so everyone gets about 30 seconds. Pierre Moscovici, what should we be taking out of this debate? Uh, first, uh, there, there, there was a debate about the limits and merits of BEPS. Uh, and I think we must be fair. Uh, it, it, it's not a panacea, but it, it shouldn't be blamed. It would be a paradox that uh, progress, even small, are blamed. Uh, second, uh, I think the EU is not OECD. It's, it's much more ambitious than OECD. And I, I hear that call and we are trying to uh, answer it. Uh, and for example, about the United States, the United States was in this screening process. I think the screening process was made honestly. So that proves that the problems are a bit different. And we must address these uh, problems which are a bit different. And finally, um, even if we think that the EU is so important, and I do, uh, so committed, and it is, uh, we need also uh, to be conscious of one of our own limits, is that on tax matters we decide by unanimity at 27. And it is not possible anymore. Frankly speaking, we need to move to qualified majority voting because we cannot accept that the veto of one blocks forever the common will of all. And that's very important to change the rules if we want to be as ambitious as people call us to be. OK, David Terra. For me, it's very simple. Every corporation in the G20 to report how much tax they paid in local currency, country by country. And I'll give you a simple example. I know uh, Google in Ireland, 22.6 billion revenue, only 5,000 employees. So each employee in Ireland in Google generates 45 million revenues. And hence, there's only one way Tell me how much taxes you pay in each country, every corporation and every citizen through the pension fund, mutual funds, ETF. If you don't see that number, I'm sorry, I blacklist the institution. Because before we wait for politicians to agree, BEP, SEPs, OECD, and all this acronym, there has been 10 years of 600 billion euro tax illusion, 6 trillion euro. As a result, it's time to act, no more words. And it's up to citizens to stand up. Okay, Pascal. I represent a country that has over 2 million people at work within it, that small to medium-sized countries uh, have a right to be competitive as well. It's not just to preserve of larger countries. Uh, and uh, we and Ireland will do that in such a way uh, that allows our country to be competitive, allows us to attract investment and create jobs in our country, while at the same time dealing with issues that we, we ourselves want to deal with. And what I want to do, what I'm doing here, and I'm delighted to be participating in this debate, is point to what Ireland is doing, point to how we use it to create jobs, but also acknowledge, I want to, the work and progress that we have made over the last number of years to tackle issues that we know needed to be tackled. Okay, when you be in, Yes, we have to understand that um, the injustices in our tax system are embedded in an economic model that rewards those at the top who have wealth and not hardworking people at the bottom. They are linked. And we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we can fix this tax system and make it just. But we lack the courage and the political will to do it. Okay, All I'll, the I'll, things that we, he has mentioned on BEPS, I acknowledge the progress of BEPS, but BEPS didn't take into account those needs of developing countries who lose more than rich countries through tax avoidance. Okay, we need to do more. A last word and, and a word if you can. <laughs> okay. So uh, the right of a small country to be competitive is absolutely uh, is important. Ireland did a good job by being competitive in developing a good education system, but stealing jobs and tax revenues for other countries should not be allowed. So there are bases, and that's why the state aid uh, provisions of Europe are designed to stop exactly that kind of unfair competition. Okay. The, wait, I'll give two more points. <laughs> One is One more. BEPS, BEPS was a move in the right direction, whether it's small or big is not the, the issue. The question is, it's far, far from enough, and the basic system is broken. I think the basic system is broken. The transfer price system can't be made to work. And the corporations who are very powerful and influential 
won't allow a change in the tax system unless citizens really get out there and express their voice and their indignation of the kind of outrage that was being mentioned earlier of companies paying 0 0.2, 0 0.02% of GDP, not bearing and, and trying to pretend to be good corporate citizens. Okay. It's only outrage that will stop uh, and reform the system. Okay, thank you very much to all of you for your time. Thank you for you here in the room as well.